Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Sheikh Usta from the I3 Studio. I'd love to send a personal message to every single I3 student. Each one of you is special, each one of you is unique. Each one of us has different skill set, and the I3 vision is about holistic development, both in Deen and Dunya. So we're providing so many different programs, in addition to the YD program that everybody, alhamdulillah, is registered in and is a basic building block for our Islamic transformation. We have Muslim manhood for the brothers, we have uh, versatile Muslim for the sisters, we have the high for business and, and entrepreneurship uh, development. We have many other projects like the legacy and the podcast and khatib development. So alhamdulillah, we're investing so much for you to become the best version of yourself. Now, all of that without, with minimal funding. There's not much funding because, as you can see, most of our programs are really uh, free. But that's where we come. The leadership part of the YD program is you taking charge. Taking charge of this institution by volunteering your skill set in some of these projects and, and basically helping us, inshallah, through donations, which you're going to get the rewards from by helping building and shaping this institution to become a bigger and better and more accessible to everybody in our community, inshallah. So go to the itinstitute.ca uh, slash donate website and please create a monthly subscription. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, everyone. I'm super excited. Welcome back to another Ramadan talk. Today, we have a very, very special guest. I'm super excited to host her. We have Um Zakia, and the topic for today is raising children in uncertain times. So the reason that we are fundraising for today is because I want us to focus on our children for today's talk, okay? We at I3 Institute are fundraising you know, to have another hub in the GTA for our youth, for our children. You know, I want you to imagine I have my own daughter now and I want her to grow up with other brothers and sisters. I want her to grow up where she's able to go and call a place, you know, a home away from home. She's able to have youth activities. She's able to attend halaqas. And we need your help. We need your help to have this Muslim community in the GTA. The link is at the bottom. So please support us by donating. Please share it with your family. Please share it with your friends. And, you know, inshallah, let's meet our donations goal all together. And, you know, speaking of children, I want to introduce Um Zakia. So she's, you know, I'm sure you guys already know her, but she's known for her soul touching books and spiritual reflections on the Quran and emotional healing. Um Zakia is a world renowned author and a soul care mentor. Um Zakia studied Arabic, Quran, Islamic sciences, Aqidah and Tafsir in America, Egypt and Saudi Arabia for more than 15 years. She currently teaches Tajweed, the rules of reciting the Quran. She teaches the tafsir, explanation of the meaning of the Qur'an, and she teaches the dabbar, which is deep reflections on the Qur'an, which is very, very important, by the way. And you can find all of this on her website, which is uzhearthub.com. And um, she's also daughter of American converts to Islam, Um Zakia, also known by her birth name, Ruby Moore, and her Muslim name, Bayana Siddiq. Now, I didn't really know that, which is a very beautiful name, by the way, Bayana. <laughs> Um, she's an internationally acclaimed, award-winning author of more than 25 books, including novels, short stories, and self-help. Her books are used in high schools and universities in the United States and worldwide, and some were made into short films. In 2020, she found UZ Heart and Soul Care, where she shares the life lessons she learned on her emotional and spiritual healing journey. And again, for more information on her courses, please go to uzhearthub.com. Welcome, Um Zakia. How are you? How's your Ramadan? How is your health? How's everything going for you? Alhamdulillah. Allah is merciful. I am doing very well. Alhamdulillah. 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 Are you excited for today's talk? A little nervous? Yeah, a little nervous. Always parenting is always a bit, you know, it's a lot of blessings, but woo, it's very deep. It is. And I'm pro I promise I won't scrutinize you today, but because I just became a mother myself eight months ago, this topic is very dear to my heart. And I really want to know what my role is as a parent and how am I supposed to raise my, you know, my beautiful young daughter with all the things that are going on today. So with that said, let's just get started. And, you know, if you want to feel free to add any comments, anything other than the question asked, uh, you know, you're more than um, free to inshallah. So the first question that I have for you is what role do parents play in today's day and age? I mean, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah, amma ba'ad. 
Well, first of all, I will say that um, parents are actually the foundation of the experience of any human soul, you know, or anyone who's a caretaker. And they set the stage of the experience of a child who then becomes an adult and who then interacts with the world. So basically you can really say parents rule the world <laughs> for better or worse, because how people process how they were raised and react to how they're raised is basically how everybody shows up in the world, you know? And um, so I would say there's, I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say that what we see happening in the world begins in the home. Yeah. You know, I wanted to comment on that just because I'm a coach and counselor myself and I see a lot of, you know, young girls come and they're talking about all the issues that they have with their parents. And I think we live in this, you know, realm of generational toxicity. So mm -hmm. how do you feel like that plays into someone's role as a parent? And when you say the, the toxicity, you're talking about the emotional wounding that people face, or are you the talking about? Yeah, the emotional wounding. And I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, sometimes we're a product of the way that we are parented, like you kind of said, right? And so, you know, how do we try to avoid taking that into our role as a parent? And, and you know, just what do you have to say about that? Pretty much? Well, I, I, when you asked that, it made me think of a situation where my daughter, she showed me this um, TikTok post where the person was saying, because they had asked like, what's something that's unpopular, people really don't know that, you know, kind of shocked them if they learned it. And the person was saying that there was a case where you had these uh, teenagers who were um, tweens and teens who were acting out in school and they had very, very violent and unruly behavior, disruptive. And the research was showing how they gave these, these children these young adults counseling, and it really had no real effect on them. However, when they put the parents in counseling, yeah. the lives of the children changed. Yeah. So yeah. really what we have to understand is that if we don't heal our own selves, we're not going to be able to be healthily present for our children and the, the higher chances that we're passing on, even if unintentionally, transgenerational trauma and wounding, because a lot of times parents are just externally focused. My child is misbehaving. My child is doing this. And you, we're not understanding that this child is just carrying a lot of the things that we are not addressing, even if we won't admit it. And, and sometimes the child themselves does not know why they're so angry, why they're frustrated, but they pick up on things. And if we are not being honest with ourselves and healing our own wounds, and we all have them, we're human beings. Nobody's, we're not angels. So we all have something to heal from in our past and in our uh, generational um, yeah, legacy, sure. so to speak, then understand that you're not going to have much of an impact on the behavior of your, the children in a good way until you correct yourself. Yeah. So then what do you think really is the problem that we're facing? Is it around that idea or is it another larger problem that we're facing today? I think that I think that one of the challenges is that we think like there's the problem, you know, <laughs> but really there are, the problems are complex. However, the root of pretty much every single problem in this world goes back to the honesty or lack thereof of each individual soul of recognizing and addressing the loom that lives inside of them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. if we're not doing that, and we see this in the Quran, you have prophets making dua, admitting to the loom. You have Musa yeah. alayhi salam, Rabbi inni dhulamtu nafsi fiqhfirli, have the dua of, of um, Yunus um, admitting being from the Dalimeen. Um, all of this, because... Allah is teaching us that you can't show up of any benefit in this world until you recognize, address, and repent from the loom and try to purify this going on. So if there is the problem, the problem would be rooted in how do you recognize and address the loom that lives in you? Forget your children, forget the world, because it's popular to, to rage against the loom in the world. It's yeah. popular to rage against the darknesses and the dirt that's around us. Yeah. But are we 
raging against the darknesses and the gloom that live inside of us. Yeah. And if yeah. we're not doing that, then we're just another gloom that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Even when we're addressing other gloom's that need to be addressed. Yeah. You know, the one problem I see with that is I feel like when parents, you know, when they're parenting, they start focusing so much on their children and raising them and seeing their mistakes and fixing them and helping them be better people that they kind of forget, you know, the, the loom that they have inside of themselves. And because of that, you know, what's happening there, there's a lot of miscommunication, there's a lot of resentment from the child to the parent. And I see that I see that in my clients, I've seen that even in myself, for example, and I see that in everyone surrounding me, whenever there's parental children issues. So how can we really bridge the, gra uh, the gap between, you know, the children and the parents, so we can really move to having healthy relationships between parents and children and not have resentment? I think that the what parents have to realize is that, yeah. you know, it's like that saying they have a saying that says children rarely do what you tell them to do, but they almost always do what you do. Yeah. So if you are not modeling honesty, admitting your faults, seeking forgiveness, even from your own children, like I do that with my daughter. I, if I get upset, I would let yeah. say, look, I'm sorry. And even sometimes when I come in her room, she has this face like, yeah, I knew you were coming because I, yeah. I was upset, you know? And so I was like, just forgive me. And if we're not doing that, I don't know that we're going to be able to create a healthy relationship. I would say over 90% of children, if you are humble enough to admit your mistakes, if you are humble enough to show up as an as a imperfect human being, with that we're not giving up your responsibility yeah. and authority as a parent, but if you model that, I believe over 90% of parental relationships will be healed tremendously. Yeah. But what happens is, is that a lot of parents, and I'm not saying that they're, they're the only one to blame. Yes, children have their responsibility, but we do have to understand the reason that children are responsible for obeying us is because we are taking responsibility and we have the knowledge and the understanding and the insight that they don't have. But if we're not acting on that, then we can't be of much help to them, you know? Yeah. So we have to show up in a, the most honest, humble way and be able to admit sincerely when we are wrong and when we wrong our children, ask, ask for forgiveness and then let them know some of the struggles that they're going to witness, things that are not like yeah. deeply private. I Like I've been very honest with my daughter about the different healing that I've been going through with my own emotional um, yeah. journey. And I even encouraged her to, to, to enroll in healing groups or therapy. Because I told her, I know I passed on some of that to you. I didn't mean to, you know. And and once I started doing that, our relationship improved almost overnight. But yeah. before, when I was just trying to wear the face of, I'm the mother and you do what I say because I said to do it because I'm in charge, it was it was a very difficult relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I ask you something, though? Like, how did you get there? Because when I think about a lot of parents, I, like, it, it's really hard, you know, I don't know how to encourage them. I don't know what to tell them apart from, you know, go to a healing group, go to therapy. But, you know, therapy is still taboo in a lot of cultures. And and I get, I get what you're saying totally, because I started healing when I went to my own therapist and I started to realize that I have to work on myself. And I'm really glad that I did that before I had children so that I can work on myself, I can heal and really have that understanding to take, you know, to my own child. Um, but how did you get there? And how are you supposed to encourage other parents to really get to that point when we have so much taboo around mental health and working on yourself? I think Allah shows us the signs if we're honestly looking, you know, I mean, the bottom yeah. line is, is that I, let's be honest, we're, we're talking about adults here. We're not talking about the children because we're talking about the yeah. adults. Yeah. You know, when you are falling apart, you know it. The question is, are you going to do something about it? Are you going to keep putting on a front, acting like everything is okay? And Allah will show you when you need help. Now, the help doesn't always, and even some of the professionals will say this, it doesn't always have to come in the form of literally getting a therapist. There are, there are self-help books out there. There are support groups. There are all kinds of videos, audio books, um, so many healing circles. There's a wealth of information out there on how to address what you're going through. 
And what happened to me was pretty much the stereotypical uh, story. I started falling apart and I couldn't mm. be fully present for my daughter in the way yeah. that I needed to be. And I decided instead of continuing the front that I was supposed to carry, I just admitted I'm not well right now. I'm, I'm having a difficult time and here's what's happening with mommy and I'm going to go and figure this out, you know? Mm. And I think it just starts there. You don't even have to have all the answers. But no. are you being honest? Because truly, when I began to talk to my daughter and I began to say that, mm -hmm. she already, she told me I saw something was wrong. She yeah. even told me like, to till today, like the period that I was going through that, I, she said, I cannot even look at pictures during that time. She said, even when you're smiling, it's like you look sad. And she keeps yeah. them put away in a drawer. And she's like, I can't even look at them. And yeah. so she was seeing the truth of me before I admitted the truth of me. Yeah. Yeah. Children are really, really smart like that. I always, my husband always tells me, he's like, you have such a small, a strong emotional connection to your mom. When she's sad, you're, you get sad. When she's angry, you kind of get really, you know, a certain type of way. And I'm like, well, that's the relationship ch children and and parents have. And so really, when I see that she's not working on herself, or she hasn't healed from certain things, it directly impacts me. And, you know, I'm taking control of that so that I can work on myself. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of parents aren't doing that. A lot of parents aren't working on themselves. And I pray well, that they do, because that's the answer, right? Well, One of it the is, answers. but you have to want it. Let's just be very honest. Let's just be really blunt here. You have to want, to want it. You have to want to be better. And, yeah. and I'm not saying that to be like dismissive. It is not easy looking at your emotional trauma, not facing bad. it um, mm -hmm. is scary, but you have to want to take that step. And this is a part of Iman. This is a part of Tawakkal. You mm -hmm. have to be able to admit that you need to go somewhere. You don't even know where this first step is. Yeah. Forget, yeah. take the first step. You don't even know where it is. I mean, that's really, really scary. Yeah. You know, I, I explained it to someone one time. I said, it's kind of like the feeling in that beginning is like you're on this plane way up in the sky and you yeah. feel like, you know, you're in danger. You know, you're in danger. And if you stay on this plane, it's probably going to be a crash at some point. Yeah. But someone says, here's how you can save yourself. Just jump out. And, and you're yeah. like, I have no parachute. I have nothing. And they'll say, don't worry. When you get to the bottom, there'll be like this very soft net. To catch you, <laughs> just have faith, you know. Yeah, that, that's how it can feel. Yeah, and so 100%. it's it, you know it feels better. Let, let me just say a couple of prayers. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, the plane won't crash. You know, you yeah. know. So that's how it feels. It is absolutely terrifying. And I didn't know what was going to happen with me. I was at that time. I was going through a divorce. I was coming back to the United States. I didn't know I didn't have a home. I, I didn't know what in the world my spiritual life has fallen apart. My emotional life has fallen apart. I have my daughter with me. I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. But I just kept yeah. making dua to Allah. And, and as cliche as that may sound, that really is your first step, is just making dua to the one who knows the life and who's in charge of the life, knows the unseen, who's in charge of the unseen. Because really... Once Allah exposes to you your breakdown, if you don't address it, you are just going to tear apart your life and the lives of the people around you. There's no other place to go. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate you because being a child and, you know, just kind of wanting parents to work on themselves. Um, I, I feel like it's so important, the message that you're giving across today. And I really hope that we have an audience that's listening to this, that's working on themselves because you know a lot of the stuff that we're discussing today about parenting and children it, it starts from the home it starts from the parents so you know i appreciate you i appreciate the work that you're doing and you know may allah spread it far and wide and guys this is the reason why we want you to donate um using the link at the bottom because i3 here truly truly invest in the children we truly believe in our children we truly want to invest because the children are the future of tomorrow and so can you imagine having a hub where we have these services right we have services where you know umzakia you are able to come fly down and have healing circles for parents 
right? Yeah. I'm able to have, you know, coaching and counseling sessions for children and parents who need it. We're able to have activities for, for the youth. We're able to have activities for the children. I didn't have that when I was growing up. Okay, I had to go and find places and find Muslims to be with. But imagine if we can have this center, which is attracting youth, attracting children, attracting parents and really, really rekindling their lives together. So we really need your support using the link at the bottom, spread it to your family and friends. Mm -hmm. um, and I have another question from you. So we often look to the Sunnah, we often look to the Prophet Sallam, of course, you know, on on tips for parenting. So what examples can you take? Sunnah um, for parenting? I think one of the most powerful examples that I take from the prophets, and it always humbles me, is their self-honesty. You know, I mean, yeah. admitting to wrong, you know, yeah. and publicly saying, I did wrong, I wronged my soul. I mean, just if, if, if that's the only thing you took from the prophets, that could change your life. I mean, you, you didn't have you know, um, Musa alayhi salam saying, oh, you know, let me not admit to my wrongdoing because what are the, what are people going to think? You know, what, am, what yeah. are my you know, children going to think or whatever? You know, we are, we, we have to be sincere, you know, and we have to really, really want to root out loom in ourselves, you know, because a lot of the things that we, we see, for example, when we don't address certain things, Allah will continue to remind us through our environment, through the people around us. Yep. And sometimes we, there are parts of us that we don't recognize. And what you'll find through what the prophets have taught us is that it's like this bringing us out of darkness into light. Like Allah talks about in the Quran, from that bulamat, all these darknesses to the nur. And you will find through the prophetic examples a lot of humility, but you will also find them facing real human trials. Like yeah. if you look at, for example, Prophet Yaqub, yeah. you know, today they would call that a dysfunctional family because you have the children gathering together, trying to kill their brother. And the other ones are like, okay, don't kill him. Let's just throw him in a well and leave him. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, mm -hmm. that's a pretty serious thing. Fam that's family problems. Yeah. Okay. And then you have Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, him having a son who he thought was righteous and obedient and, 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 and dedicated to him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind his back, living a completely yeah. different life and having to face at the moment where he was, was, Allah was fulfilling his promise to save all of the believers watching the, his beloved son drown in front of him yeah. and learning at that moment that he was not truly of his family in the way that Allah defines it. Yeah. You know, they, those are also lessons to take these. They didn't just have a smooth sailing, easy life, you know, where everything worked out in their favor. And you'll also find that when you look at the prophets and even, uh, uh, the, the Sahaba and, and you you will find they went through regular life trials and I rem I was reading a book some a few years ago and I had learned something I didn't know I didn't know that uh, at least in the book that I was the the Sira book that I was reading it, and it was saying how the daughters two of the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu right before he got revelation he had married them to the daughters of Abu Lahab okay yeah. and then they yeah. were divorced and sent back. <laughs> after the revelation, because the, Abu Lahab wanted to punish them to say, you know, um, yeah. we don't want anything to do with them. And the reason I'm saying this is that the, the stories that we tell ourselves, and I call them like almost like spiritual fairy tales. Yeah. That what life you're going to have if you believe in Allah and everything's going to work out for you. Yeah. Your families or your children will be perfect. You will never get a divorce. You know, all of these lies, uh, that's what they are, basically, that we tell ourselves that we get as a result of being a Muslim. You find that uprooted through the stories of the real life of prophets and the people yeah. around them. Yeah. And you know, one thing that you mentioned in the beginning was they're very honest. And I like to use the word vulnerable. Um, they were very vulnerable with what they were feeling and what they were going through, which I feel like today we, we people genuinely have a problem with, you know, they're not okay to be vulnerable, they're not okay to accept, you know, their their faults and their mistakes, or even dig deep and say, hey, this is what I'm going through. And this is, you know, kind of what's happening. And so do you feel like that vulnerability is is kind of missing in the environment today? <laughs> 
for some people it is, you know, you have, you have to, with vulnerability, you do have um, two extremes. You have one extreme of people who try to be so strong. They yeah. don't want to be vulnerable at all. They don't want to admit any faults. Everything's a fight. If someone reminds them of anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you have the people who take vulnerability to the extreme where they yeah. try to be victim of everything. Everything is yeah. poor me, poor me. And they yeah. use it to get out of obligations that Allah said, oh, you know, I have this yeah. stress, so I don't have to pray. Yeah. Oh, you know, I, I, you know, you know, I, I, my doctor said that, you know, I, you know, saying those prayers every day can really not be good for my mental health, whatever it is. But the Islam is in the middle, is the middle path. Yeah. We, we don't seek so much vulnerability to expose everything that's going on and try to get everybody to feel sorry for us with no purpose except that and to try to get out of our obligations to Allah because of our trials and we don't go to the other extreme you know so we yeah. we just we acknowledge our, um that we are human you know yeah. and we have to be vulnerable you can't actually you can't truly have true iman and taqwa without vulnerability it's impossible you just can't, yeah, even if you can, even yeah. If we, yeah, get beyond the emotional thing. The emotional reality and the spiritual reality are connected, by the way. Like yeah. if the human soul has the core is the spiritual, then you also have the emotions. And this is something that the Quran makes very clear. This is why we worship Allah with love, hope, fear. These are all emotions in this world, but they are part of our spiritual existence. So yeah, 100%. I think that... I think it can be scary and humiliating to realize that you're going to have to admit your problems. Yeah. Um, but the alternative is exponentially worse. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. So we want to take a quick break, but before we do that, I have one more question, not for me, but from the audience. Mm -hmm. So the question is how can you get your child to prioritize important things like their dean from a young age? How can you get them to love their dean? The shortest answer now, of course, we always remember Allah is in charge of hearts. And, and remember the dua of the parent is answered. But the shortest answer is you prioritize it yeah. and you love it and you live it. You live that love and priority and you should live it in compassion and happiness. If you show up to prayer like, oh, it's for sure. Oh. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, your children are probably not going to love getting up, you know. Yeah. But if you connect it with compassion. Like for example, one of the things I've consciously strived to do with my daughter is I'm waking up her for prayer, waking her up for prayer. I would say, sweetie, honey, you know, very soft yeah. words, you know, not like, get up, I told you a million times. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spare them, you know, so that you need to, they need to associate the prayer and acts of worship was something beautiful. And even I, yeah. one of the things that my parents would do sometimes is after we prayed, they would just give us a hug. So yeah. it's like we begin to associate compassion and love with different things, whatever works for you and your home. But the shortest answer, and obviously Allah is in charge of hearts, Yeah. but is yet obviously make dua, the dua of the parents answer. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu taught. You prioritize the deen. And you love the dean and everything around them will reflect that with yeah. very rare exceptions. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, you know, that's 100%. what I love. Hundred percent. I mean, Allah bless you. Let's take a quick break. Um, we have a video to show you guys and inshallah, we'll come back with more juicy questions. Inshallah. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. People ask us, what makes your center special? Why should we donate and support this center? Isn't it just one more center? And we tell them, listen, number one, in addition for this to be actually a masjid, we're building a bigger facility that has other functions within this Islamic center. The most important, which is, was our dreams when we were younger, to have a place that's run fully by the youth. And we're building an Islamic center today. Our board in the IT Institute is 90% youth under the age of 35 under the age of 35, 90% of our board, they have full say, they're the ones who's running the show. They will run this Islamic center. They will decide and make decisions for themselves and by themselves and for other youth. Inshallah, 
Um, we have many reverts in the community. Alhamdulillah, we see them accept Islam, but often, unfortunately, we don't see them again. We want the center to be not only a place for spiritual development of the wider community, but also of reverts to come and feel like they're a place at home where they can also, also socialize, meet others, be well integrated into the community. So we need to focus on that segment as well, inshallah, as more reverts come to the community. And the third point is our sisters. Everybody knows since 2015, the IT Institute have been investing in sister leadership development specifically. Today, alhamdulillah, everything within the Institute is mostly split 50-50. We have 50% of sisters on our boards. We have 50% in our regional boards. We have 50% sister instructors in the IC Institute. And we want them to basically develop their own programs by themselves, for themselves, and really take lead of their own lives. Alhamdulillah, for the past few years also, we've been working on professional development, career development, helping youth and young professionals get into careers and paths that they can inshallah make the best of their dunya and support the wider community outside. We want this place to be a place that is buzzing with workshops, with activities, with professionals that come mentor the youth and inshallah help them get into various you know professions and inshallah opportunities out there for them and for their future inshallah. Please support us so we can make this dream come true today. May Allah accept from everyone. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. All right, welcome back. And I just want to reiterate again, we need you to make the dream come true, right? Again, I really, you know, my daughter is nine months and I keep mentioning her because I miss her a lot, you know, especially because we're talking about this topic. And when I think about things that I have to work on and, and, you know, just like kind of the parenting idea, it really makes you emotional sometimes. And so I really want to raise her in an environment with other, you know, other children her age where she's able to, you know, talk to them and, and connect with them. And if she has any issues with me, she can go to, you know, someone else. And if she, you know, has any issues with bullying, then she has an avenue to go to. She wants to practice her cooking skills and she has you know programs that she can attend so we really 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 need your support this ramadan there's a link right at the bottom all you have to do is just quickly you know go on it click it share it with your friends and family inshallah and you know donate whatever you can every little bit counts um you know i can't even express how important it is to to have the center inshallah so welcome back how are you doing Sister, how is everything so far in the last I'm five minutes? <laughs> okay. I'm good. Very, very well. Okay. And I wanted you know, to add to that about the donation. I wanted to yeah, point sure. out that one of the things about raising our children that we need to, we, they need to see us investing right. in things that help this world and the soul and the, you know, the, the Muslim yeah. community and how we spend our money. It says a lot. And one of the unfortunate things that we find today and i know that running a program you know you know muslims tend to think oh if it's about allah we shouldn't have to give any money to it and we shouldn't have to pay for anything and i would say raising your children change that narrative and teach them that the the ones who have the greatest right to the wealth that allah has given them are the people who are believers don't teach them that all of the wealth Allah gives us, we give to Netflix and movies and, 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 you know, food and, you know, junk food and all this. But then when it comes to the Muslims, we need to be really picky, you know, uh, it's very, very important that we learn how to be examples of spending our money to support believers, whether it's donation or it's a business that Muslims are running because we keep running in circles. Why is the Ummah like this? Why is like this? But how do we treat the believers who are offering us services, whether it's for the dean or for something for the dunya that we want? And are we more quick to give money to people who we don't even ask questions? I mean, let's just be honest. People who who want to listen to whatever they want to listen to, they're not wondering how's Beyonce spending that money. You know, <laughs> they want to <laughs> if they want to listen to Beyonce, they're giving it. So I just wanted to say we need to be examples also with our children with how we spend our money and allow them when you give them money to choose something to invest in that the Muslims are offering so that they learn from a young age that the risk that Allah gives them, our love for the deen shows and how we spend the wealth that Allah gives us. Yeah, absolutely. Jazakallah for that, sis. 
I have a super juicy question for you, and I'm really excited to see the answer for this one. Um, but I think it's important because the question is, do you think that the idea of obeying parents is abused today? By the parents or by the children? I would say by society and by the parents in general. Because, I mean, the children, they only get the understanding from their parents and society, right? And how you're supposed to obey the parents. So do you think this idea of obeying the parents in general is abused today? It absolutely is abused today. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it is um, parents, um, not all, but many parents use the obligation to obey them as a, as a means to emotionally manipulate, control um, their children and to stoke their ego and to present a certain image to the world. And they will guilt them down from everything from um, okay. something personal they just want for themselves to uh, who they marry, uh, to what field they go into, and sometimes down to accepting outright abuse. You know, and this is the root of a lot of the trauma in religious environments yes, is 100%. that there's no question about it, that parents abuse this. I'm not do all, but yeah, absolutely yeah. it's abuse. Do you think that it comes from the sense of responsibility? Because I'm reflecting on myself, right? I feel like when, as soon as I became a parent, I felt the sense of responsibility and all of a sudden, that sense of responsibility, I, I've started noticing it comes with like, no, I know, I know better. You know, of course, my daughter is only eight months, so I do know better. She can't really tell right from wrong. But I also catch myself, you know, not abusing that because I don't want to, you know, be one of those parents that abuse that and say, you know, well, I'm always right and you're never wrong, especially as she starts growing up. So do you think that it starts coming from a sense of responsibility combined with parents who don't have a lack of, you know, contemplation on their own behavior? Because, I mean, if they had contemplation, then maybe they would take that responsibility and not abuse it. I don't know. Well, I would say that the, the human soul and the human heart is very tricky. Because I don't know. Like, I see it. I see it in myself. As soon as I became a parent, I started automatically feeling like, oh, my God, I'm a parent. Like, I have to make sure that what she's doing is right. And, and you know, no, Hidaya, my daughter's name is Hidaya. You can't do this and you can't do that. And I'm just curious to see how that's going to develop in myself. And I, I hope that I can catch myself and my husband can catch me and, and not let it get out of hand. This is where we talked about the loom and looking yeah. inside yourself is very important because it's not it's just a black and white issue. It's not just yeah. oh, parents want what's best, and that's what's happening. And it's not parents want is they're uh, that they're is doing evil, and that's what's happening. What's happening is that yes, we want we care about our children. We have go into this protective mode, and we want yes, we get into this panic. I I don't I want to protect them from all harm. That is true, but there's also the hidden part where in the the emotional healing work they will call it shadow work. Yeah. But we can just call it the darknesses and diseases that are hidden from us inside of our souls that Allah mm -hmm. exposes. I'll give an example. Like I was talking to my daughter the other day about, you know, some of the journeys that we had. And I was telling her some lessons I learned as a parent. And I was I, there was one conversation we had about there was a particular Islamic issue that I felt very strongly about. The scholars had ikhtilaf on it. I forgot what it was. It was something mm -hmm. either dealing with hijab or music. I forgot what it was now. But I was convinced that my point of view and um, perspective on it was right. And yeah. she disagreed with me. And I was just like, no, she can't do this because then she's going to be corrupt. If, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I was going back and forth. And then yeah. a lot like, like the a feeling came in my heart to what is this is about? What is this about? Like she's letting you know she, because of rule, just to, to give you some background, one of the rules yeah. that I started with her around eight years old was I had her um, begin to, whenever there were certain issues, to, to yeah. make to research it, make istikhara, make dua, and decide what she believed, you know? Okay. And I was like, if you consult Allah, I told her my agreement is if you consult a lot and you make dua about it, even if I disagree with you, I'm going to, I'm going to leave you alone. I will let you know what I believe. And if there's something that's going to be a rule in our household, then I will let you know. And I would do that with ikhtilaf issues. And I would do that sometimes with certain decisions, whether she should go over a friend's house, 
I mean, obviously that I trusted, you know, to spend the night. And, and we yeah. started doing that to develop her own critical thinking. And, and she had enough from a young yeah. age. Yeah. But one day I was like, oh no, you picked the wrong opinion. So I was, you know, I was just going at her. And my point is, is that at a certain point, and I was telling her internally, I began to feel scared. I had yeah. this fear of not her soul. At first to start off, I was fearing for her soul, but it switched to, I'm Um Zakia. I'm a public figure. If my daughter goes out in the world looking like this particular, dressing this way or following this opinion on music or whatever, what does that say about me? And it went yeah. into ego. And yeah. I had to pull back and say, whoa, 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 inside of myself to say, this is not healthy parenting. Yeah. This is not healthy parenting. And I had to check myself because I said, I sat with myself and I said, she's now in puberty. She yeah. has to learn to take responsibility for herself. She does not agree with you. She looked at the issue. Maybe later on she will learn more about it, but she sincerely believes her point of view is right. Yeah. What yeah. are you afraid of? And I had to sit with myself and ask, am I afraid that Allah is going to punish her because she didn't come to the conclusion I did? Or am I scared that what I, how I have to explain myself to the world teaching about Islam and my daughter is out here with this completely different point of view. And really part of it, it started um, off, I was worried about her soul. And then it became, I was worried about my image. And I said, you know what? Astaghfirullah, I made dua for Allah to forgive me. And I went to her and I said, you know what? Just continue to make dua, ask Allah's guidance and forgiveness and do what you believe is right. And just, uh, and, and I left, left it alone. So it's a mixture that's going on. You know, yeah. it's not always just, because I could have played the card of, I know what's best. And then I had to ask myself, do I? Be because truly yeah. at the end of the day, if I am not trusting Allah to allow her to guide and protect her through her own imperfections, then do I really want what's best for her or do I want to keep her having a certain image in front of me in the world? Yeah, you know, I'm learning so much from you and these two questions I think kind of tie in. Um, so the first one is, Parents often feel children are becoming disrespectful. So let's say in your scenario, if there's another parent, they might think, well, how dare you, you know, and then they might start using the word disrespectful to their child. So parents often feel children are becoming disrespectful and children feel parents don't understand them. So what do you think is happening here? And I actually want to add something to that just so you can kind of give like a thorough answer. And, and you know, how do we set healthy boundaries with our children as they enter into their teens? I don't know if they're two separate questions, but maybe you can kind of tie it in together. I will, I will, I will say, um, let me work backwards for a second. Give them options in the boundaries because you said teens. We're not talking about five years old. You need to prepare that teen to live a life without you. If you're not doing that, then you're not raising yeah. them properly. And mm -hmm. what I mean by boundaries in terms of giving the options, you know that something needs to be done. Say, okay, here are your choices. What do you, what would you like to do? Whenever possible, and make inside of the options, all of them are khair, inshallah. Let them begin mm -hmm. to choose. Because, you know, obviously if they're doing something haram and they want to just do something that you can't support, that's a separate issue. But I would say the vast majority of the disagreements between parents and teens it's not about someone just wanting to blatantly disobey Allah. It really is more subjective. And I would say for me, what worked for me was giving my daughter that permission for to do the istikhara. And I stopped at a certain point. I removed, once she reached a certain age, I removed punishment. I would only have um, basically a sort of self-reflection contemplation mm -hmm. and she would have to come to me read the quran read something and present her case to me to convince me of something you know mm -hmm. i removed the command punishment mm -hmm. thing as she got older but in terms of the parents feeling the children are disrespectful and the mm -hmm. children feeling like the parents don't understand them both are happening they're not mutually exclusive they're both happening yeah. and they're both happening widespread yeah. But I still believe that the greater responsibility is on the parent to be compassionate. And a lot of times what parents are interpreting as disrespect. Now, the disrespect is happening. Is the parents paying 
painful trigger of an ego because the child doesn't agree with them. That is different yeah. from disrespect. Disagreement is not disrespect. Here's what happens a lot of times. First of all, remember, they're still young. They haven't quite perfected hikmah. Look at us. We're in the masjid. We can't even, we're grown and can't even figure out hikmah and rahmah and speaking to each other properly, right? Yeah. What about a teenager? Many times, and I think we need to have husnul done with our teens. Yeah. Many times they are just giving you their raw, authentic heart. They're frustrated. They're confused. They don't understand. And they say that. They don't even intend any disrespect. They purely intend to communicate their feelings. And it really is that simple. But what happens is the parent goes into ego mode instead of rahma and compassion mode. And they say, who do you think you're talking to like that? Yeah. And the child then becomes, what do you mean? No, you heard it. Ah. And then they do become disrespectful. But now it's a fight. Yeah. But had you just sat and listened, one of the things I wrote to myself, a note to myself, listen to your daughter with your heart. Yeah. Listen to her heart. Forget her words. Forget her mannerisms. Listen with, listen to her heart. What is her heart saying? Not her words. And just patiently allow her to get through this moment as best she can. She's hurting. And a sign that she really doesn't mean to be disrespectful is she's talking to you. She's yeah. talking to you. So she's trusting that you're going to hold her through this. Yeah. And the fact, the minute they stop talking to you, that's when you have a real big problem. But they're trusting you to, to, to hear their heart. They don't know all the fancy words to say. So what yeah. we end up doing is picking a fight with our children, starting a fight with our children, micromanaging their voice, micromanaging their facial expression in a moment when all they wanted, all they were doing was rawly sharing as authentically as possible what was going on in their heart. And we could have stopped the, the, the train wreck if we just quietly and compassionately listened. listened. Yeah. Let them finish. And then later you can say, sweetheart, I really appreciate you sharing. But next yeah. time, not at the moment of the frustration, but once it's passed and just say next time, here are some uh, voice tones that are better. Here are some word choices that are better. Get out of your ego. Get out of your pride. Recognize when you're being triggered versus being disrespected. They're not the same thing. Yeah. And yes, over time, and usually, I'm just going to be frank, usually the problem of disrespectful children, there are exceptions, is the parents not responding patiently, compassionately in the beginning. So it's very, it's uh -huh. kind of like um, you're trying to say something to someone. Let's just look at, let's, let's take out emotions for a second. If yeah. someone's on the phone and you're like, hello, you can't hear them. Hello, hello, you raise your voice. And that's what's happening. The child is screaming, hear me. And they're yeah. trying to say and do whatever you they can to get your attention to say, see me, I matter. Yeah. And I'm not saying that makes it right, but I'm saying there's an emotional and psycho psychology behind this emotional science and psychology behind what's going on. It's not rocket science. Yeah. Let's is how did you 99% of the time we've created the problem we're seeing in our children I'm just yeah. and I'm just oh, wow. coming as an angel I'm saying I I made my mistakes myself yeah that doesn't mean the children don't have the responsibility to <clears throat> be respectful but have you yeah. modeled even respect to them and I'm not saying respect in the same way but have you modeled respect have you modeled compassion? Have you modeled caring about them? Yeah. And if you haven't done that, your result will 99.9% .9 of the time be a disrespectful, rebellious, angry child who is wronging you because they know that that's the only way you will see them. Yeah, subhanAllah. And you know, it just drives us back to that first point that you made where parents need to work on themselves. They need to work on their healing. They need to be very introspective because if they're not, 
all of these things are going to happen. So I really pray that our parents are able to hear this message loud and clear um, and, and work on themselves and, 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 you know, really take these practical steps. And, and that's kind of the next questions. I know you're sharing so many gems and I feel like I'm going to go back. I told my husband, I'm like, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm host. He loves your book, by the way. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, Hey, I'm hosting her. So please like tune in and listen. Cause now we're in both new parents. Um, so I'm going to go back and definitely listen into some practical steps and maybe even message you privately. But what are some more practical steps that you can give, you know, for parents to take when it comes to parenting and kind of maybe even listening to their child, like very practical steps that they can take? I would say um, I'll just read a couple of things that I wrote down, because when I saw the topic, I went back. There was a I was invited to speak at his parenting conference out of the UK. Yeah. And I just I'll just read a couple of things I said about this topic. Um, number one. And this is rooted in um, Ayah 6 in, from Surah Al-Tahrim, mm -hmm. that you are a facilitator of their soul care, not a controller. And this is based on Allah asking us to save ourselves and our children from the fire. Yeah. And you save them. See, we, we think that saving our children is controlling our children, but it's being a compassionate facilitator, just like the Prophet ﷺ was to us. Okay. You are a facilitator of their soul care, not a controller. Um, number two, focus on what your work today, meaning you as a parent, what you're doing and how you're showing up to your soul and to your family, what will that bring forth for tomorrow? Okay. Meaning you have to believe in the life. Don't be so fixated on seeing the results today. Like if you go back to, for example, potty training, are you going to expect a, a two or three year old to get it all right immediately? Or are you going to be patient that sometimes you're going to have an accident? Sometimes you're going to have to clean up the floor. Are you going to sit and scream at a two or three year old that they didn't do it right? Same thing with as they get older, become tweens and, and teens. So focus on what your work today will bring forth tomorrow instead of fixating on all the things that are going on, uh, that are going wrong right now. Okay. And then number three, and I think this is the most important is Allah comes before you. If you don't understand this, you cannot be a healthy parent. And one of the, I wrote a journal about this. Um, and I said, when we teach our children to put Allah first, we need to understand that this means he comes before even us. And while this means they will be, um, be it in the lat, they, meaning they will hold on to their faith throughout their lives, it also means that they'll sometimes make life decisions that we neither understand nor agree with. And if this disturbs us more than the alternative, seeking to control their thoughts and choices, then we need to, to teach ourselves the same lesson we taught our children, which is Allah comes first. Um, okay. And so, and I would say that, and then a couple more points is that in this constantly ask a lot to make your heart as a parent sincere, such that you place your trust in him instead of obsessing over your children's actions and behavior and your public image as a result. And number four, their soul isn't your soul, meaning you need to compassionately respect your children as full human beings. And number five, and lastly, this is the last point I will say. Protect your children from spiritual abuse. And what I mean by that, do not plant the seeds of spiritual abuse at home by telling them because I said so is enough of a reason for them at all times to obey. Understand that when you don't raise them with critical thinking and wanting to purify their soul, you're teaching them with anyone is more powerful, stronger, they tell you to do something, you do it. Yeah. You have to teach them to have healthy spiritual autonomy rooted mm -hmm. in the Quran and the prophetic teachings, even independent of you. And you have to instill in them the ability to healthily and respectfully say no to anything and anyone that tells them something that they genuinely believe can harm their soul, including you, and you need to respect it. Wow. That is how you protect your children from spiritual abuse. SubhanAllah.
so many gems here. I can't even like, I feel like I wish I was listening as opposed to hosting just so I can like take down notes and everything. But inshallah, I'm going to go back to this. Um, the next question actually is kind of going off the spiritual abuse. You know, how can imams and, and leadership, people in leadership positions, so people in general, help parents and children navigate? Because sometimes they're adding to the spiritual abuse, right? They always use the, well, you can't, they, you can't say, oof, so go back and, you know, respect your parents. And, and Well, you know, I don't know. I'm just going to say something that yeah. might be very controversial, but our imams yeah. need to get their emotional healing done too. They need to do the same thing as parents, it's no different. Go get your emotional healing done. Find out where your emotional wounds are, male or female spiritual teachers, imam, sheikh. We all have it. We're human beings. And when you do that, when you go do the internal work, you can show up with compassion and empathy and understanding, and you will be more fit to be a leader. Yeah. And if an imam or a sheikh has not addressed their own emotional wounds, they're not going to be able to be healthy leaders for us. And that's just the bottom line. Yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned that. And you're right, it might be controversial to a lot of people, but they're human beings. And, and if they're not working on themselves, they're just adding to the spiritual abuse that we see happening today. So yeah. for that, let's take a really quick break um, to show another video and then we'll come back and we'll kind of start wrapping things up, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear I3 students, shall all of you are enjoying the YD classes that have been launched. Some of you have been with us for a while. Alhamdulillah, over 70 classes running per week to inshallah transform and motivate everyone to become the best Muslim they can be. And for transformation to happen, we have 61 YD teachers teaching all these classes free of any salaries inshallah. But we still need your support. We need your financial support so we can do all the good stuff that we're planning to do. This will go exclusively for the programs and for inshallah different things that we have planned for the community to engage better and to help provide better opportunities for everyone. And if each one of us does their little small contribution, mashallah we're going to be able to do great things together. So please go to the website at www.itinstitute.ca slash donate and please grab that subscription for donations. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum. Allah accept from all. Assalamu alaikum. All right. Welcome back uh, once again. How are you doing, sister? Alhamdulillah. Allah is merciful. How are you doing? Jazakallah khair. You know, I think it's it's going great so far. Lots and lots of practical tips. Um, someone in the comments mentioned that they have goosebumps, and I literally have goosebumps because I think I don't remember which point it was. I almost felt like emotional and crying because I was like, parenting seems. I don't want to use the word hard. It just seems. I don't even know if I want to use their challenging, right? It just seems like there is. You have to be very conscious, yeah. and sometimes being conscious can be scary. Because sometimes you just kind of want to just go through it. But really, if you want to be a good parent, then you have to be conscious. And then being conscious can be really scary. And so it made me really emotional. So JazakAllah for doing what you're doing and being with us here today. I do have another question for you. And I think this is kind of wrapping up the whole, whole kind of talk that we have today. Um, what do you think about the Western influences so this idea of, you know, being very individualistic, selfish, and I'm not talking about in a healthy way, in a very selfish kind of way, you know, only looking after yourself and not caring about other people's feelings and how parents should avoid that affecting their children. So this idea of secularism and liberalism and, and all of these things. Well, I will say I want to separate these because, you know, okay, I'm sure. OK, I'm my my background is American. My parents converted to Islam. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna. I have a different take on people's perception of the negative Western individual thing. I believe that as a culture, and and I'm, this is separate from the secularism and all the, that type of thing. That's a separate topic. I think that that is abused by Muslims. That, that this kind of like a catchphrase: "Oh, the Western influence," and they're teaching our children to be okay. independent. Um, the Western world to that we live in today. Yeah. While there is definitely a lot of in emphasis on the individual, there's also a lot of things that emphasize community work. Um, and a lot of the work about the individual, not all of it, but I'm saying a lot of it is really about a person being able to healthily show up in the world 
as an autonomous soul. Yeah. That actually is in keeping with Islam. Mm -hmm. Like like in the Quran, Allah says, La ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion in the, in the mm -hmm. deen, in uh, the way of life. We call, we have our whole entire deen is da'wah. And that concept is rooted in the respect of the autonomy of the individual soul. The foundation of Islam is the individual soul to the point where on the day of judgment, you can't blame scholars, you can't blame your parents, you will be called to account for your life. So to me, and having traveled to different parts of the world through some in, in predominantly Muslim countries and some that have just a large Muslim majority, I'm thankful for my Western influence. And I believe that is more Islamic than what some of the things I saw, because it was this pressure from people in it was like this the individual soul was erased in a lot of these muslim areas where you didn't even have the right to have autonomy whether it's in your marriage and nothing was I your own what you mean yeah i believe the root of the individualism that people demonize actually has its roots, even in the United States, in something that that was meant, they meant, well, now obviously they did a lot of things that were wrong, but the original people were coming here were escaping this sort of oppression where you didn't have the right to your soul. So when certain things were written in the constitution, they were trying to revive what they believe were their God-given rights, one nation under God, and in, in addition to that, you find the churches, like my family, they my parents coming from yeah. the church, a lot of community work. Although there was the individual, they, they were saying, but when God gives you the blessings, it's your responsibility to give. Yeah. So I think that what happens is a lot of people use the Western influence as a, as a way to not really face that their children are individually rebelling, not because of the West, but because of what they're witnessing in the home. I, yeah. I kind of get a little sensitive about that as an American, because yeah. this is kind of like catchphrase, oh, the Western influence, the Western influence. Um, research has shown, and even Allah talks about in the Quran, when you tell people to follow the right way, what did they say? They don't say, oh, I'm going to follow the West. They say, I'm going to follow what my father's in. People are going to be looking at what's happening in the home. The West is not going to be influencing your child as much as you influence your child. No. And how do you allow, and if you and if you come to your children about all of these things that the West is the big bad West, they see right through that. You know, they these children who, especially once they reach teenagers, they know that everything is not innocent. They know the TV is not perfect. But how are you teaching them through your own example to filter through these messages around them, whether it's from the West or from India, whether it's from Pakistan or Saudi Arabia, yeah. they have to be able to filter. We They shouldn't feel safe because it came from the East. So it's OK. <laughs> you know, that's not Islam. So yeah. I challenge that to yeah. say that that's not 100 percent correct. I don't agree with that. And I'm as an American and having traveled and seen the result of people's mentality with that. I thank yeah. God for my culture because what I've witnessed in other cultures is the total erasing of the individual soul that Allah has taught us in the Quran. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like when people say, and now that I'm thinking about from your perspective, what you're saying, I think we're on the same page. I think it really means like the non-Islamic ideals, right? Like if you have Islam in the home, um, how is how are the non-Islamic ideals influencing your home? Yeah, and, and, that's, and like, that's true. Yeah, yeah I and get that's that. True. And that, yeah, and yeah. that's true. And I want to address that too, but I wanted to make it clear that yeah, the West isn't bad. You know, it's not all bad. You know, now if we're talking about the non-Muslim Western influence, okay, yes. we yeah. need to be very specific because the, the the idea of the individual having a right to their life is actually from Allah. Yeah. And that part of the founding of the United States of America is in keeping with our deen. Yeah. Now, yeah. when that begins, the individual begins right. to conflict with the the what uh, the rights of Allah and the West. Absolutely. Many parts of the Western culture absolutely support that. 
at that point, this is where all of the things we talked about before come in. This is the scariest part of parenting. Yeah. We are, we pretty much have to understand that by doing the things that we talked about earlier, at a certain point, you are on a prayer and you're like the mother of Musa throwing your child into the river. It reaches that point and it's hard, mm -hmm. but, and I'm saying that keeping in mind that you do all of those things beforehand. And there was a video that my daughter showed me that the woman was saying that parenting stops. This was a non-Muslim woman. She was saying based yeah. on research, parenting stops at 13. And what she meant by that was that anything that you have not instilled in your child by 13, it's not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to start from scratch. She mm. said, because research shows that once the body and the emotions change, 13 is a time of exploring who I am as a person, testing boundaries, and you can only emphasize the parenting that you've already done before that. And, and, and let's be honest that the most critical time when the Western influence becomes very relevant is around that age. Because yeah. before that, they're pretty much just, hey, wherever mommy goes or daddy goes, I'm happy. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, know and you might control their TV. They might get a little bit upset, but they still haven't quite figured out what this world is. Yeah. So you at a certain point, you're going to have to just keep emphasizing. And that's where the healthy spiritual autonomy comes in. The istikhara. That's how I handle it with my daughter. I said, I said, if you can go to Allah with this. What do you want to do? And you can come to me and say, I pray to Allah. I made turaka and I made dua and I feel okay with it. I will let you do it. Unless it's something, a clear sin, obviously. Yeah, and okay. I honored that. Was I scared? Yes, I was scared. I was absolutely terrified. She's going to go out and do whatever she wants. She's going to say, I prayed this to Hara, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, yeah. but what happened one day was really profound. And I knew she really wanted to go to this, uh, some, um, slumber party or something with uh, some of her friends. I didn't like it, but she was old enough that I, I'd like the family, but I just felt like I didn't really like it, you know? Yeah. And she was, I want to go. And I was like, I don't like this mommy. Da, da, da. And then I said, you know what, Farida? I said, um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to let you decide, but I'm going to express to you my concerns. And she was like, she was so happy. Right. <laughs> and I said, and if you go to Allah, you pray istikhara and you come back to me and you feel okay with going, I'll let you go. She's like, really? And she was like, I was like, yes. And I was scared in my heart, you know, but I felt this big tug of war happening, you know, yeah, between yeah. us. And I didn't want that. And I believe that was the best thing. She came to me and her face had changed. She said, mommy, I don't think I should go. Oh my God. Kind of love. Allah, she was only like nine or 10. And I looked at her and I said, well, what happened? She said, I don't know. I was so excited when I started my prayer. But when I finished and I made the dua, I felt like I shouldn't go. SubhanAllah. And that, from yeah. that moment, I said, Allahu Akbar. Yeah, Allah I placed my trust in Allah and he took care of me and my mm -hmm. daughter. So SubhanAllah. 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 So many, so many gems. And uh, I just went run in the comments. Uh, someone said that, you know, this should be a lecture that literally every parent is watching. Um, and I would highly recommend for this to be shared far and wide, shared in all your social media channels and all your WhatsApp groups, all your Telegram groups, because really, I think it, it's, it's gems that we don't hear a lot. We always hear, you know, the Hadith about not saying oof to your parents and not saying oof to your mom, which I understand, but we don't hear this side of it. And yeah. so, you know, it, it's definitely very, very important. There's so many other areas that I wanted to explore with you based on the audience questions about like, influences and you know raising uh, you know co-parenting scenarios and just so much that we can explore we have to end off today i think we should do a part two and a part three and a part four or like a series or something inshallah um, but did you have any final comments sis before we kind of start wrapping up any things that you want to add i would say be compassionate and patient with yourself and be compassionate and patient with your children and Understand that whatever it is that you want to happen to your children is not going to happen except through the qadr of Allah. So you have to have tawakkul. You have to have tawakkul. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Jazakallah khair, um, Sister Um Zakia. And you know, I don't know, do you like being called Um Zakia or do you like being called um, your original name? Like which one oh, it do doesn't you... matter, but in public yeah. it's either Um Zakia only because it's just people, a, people know they, it. they will know who you're talking about. Yeah. But I don't yeah. mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Um, Jazakallah khair, everyone for watching, you know, tuning in, being patient with all our questions and our breaks. And once again, you know, I really want to encourage everyone to donate. It's not for my sake, it's not for your sake, but it's the sake of the future, future generation, okay? We're raising the future generation today. We need your help, we need your support. Use the link right at the bottom. It's i3institute.ca slash donate. Very simple link, share it in all your groups. It's Ramadan, right? And, and, and you know, all of us take out money to donate in Ramadan. So use your money wisely. It's, it's you know, use it carefully, but use it wisely because you, your children are going to ask you tomorrow, where did you spend your money? What did you do? And, uh, you know, I'm struggling with drugs. I'm struggling with, you know, so on and so forth. And what did you do about that? And so if you're not supporting centers like this and initiatives like this, then truly we can't complain tomorrow when our children are struggling. So, you know, um, we need the center. We need the youth to come together. We need all these activities and more events and more, you know, opportunities like this. So consider donating. Spread the link. Jazakumullah khair. I hope everyone has a great evening. Uh, what time is it where you're at right now, sis? 3.11. Okay, so we're at the same time zone. Okay, perfect. All right, Jazakum Allah khair, everyone. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jazakum Allah khair, everyone, for tuning in.